human the, and the vertebrate kidney. So when we look at the vertebrate kidney, it has a renal artery that transports blood to the kidney. for filtration. And this renal artery is going to branch, and it's going to branch into um, what is referred to as the afferent arterial. So we have what is called the afferent arterial. And this is just a small artery. So remember when we talked about capillary exchange, we talked about capillaries and arterials, bring them into this. So the afferent arterial is carrying it into a specialized capillary that is called the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is where filtration occurs. So it contains capillaries. So it puts filtration by specialized capillaries. So hopefully when you're filtrating the blood, the red blood cells don't leave the blood. So the red blood cells stay, but the nitrogenous waste and maybe a lot of the other water and good solutes can go into the filtrate, which is going to be the in what is referred to as the nephron. So this is the beginning of the nephron. So I'm just going to write that in parentheses. So this is my beginning. of nephron and we'll show you that i'll show you that picture in a minute okay so from the glomerulus blood then travels this is a little confusing it's a very specialized system it's called the efferent arterial okay so this carries blood away from that filtration membrane away from the glomerulus so i just remember a comes before e so afferent is carrying it in, efferent is carrying it out, okay? But there's lots of good things that need to be taken back out of the filtrate. And so this is, goes into what is called the peritubular capillaries. Okay, and a special structure called the vasa recta. So think about what the peritubular means. Peri means around the tubes, and the tubes are the nephrons. And then the vasa recta is just a specialized capillary that is around specifically um, the part of the nephron called the loop of Henry. We'll, I'll talk more about that, okay? So from the peritubular capillaries, it then goes to the renal vein and then back to the heart. Okay. So I think that that's why they have afferent and efferent arterioles because we still have to go back to another capillary before we get back to the vein. Okay. So that's why they call those both things, those both, both of those being arterioles. Okay. okay. So if we look at a di the diagram, Okay, this is actually a picture in your book um, that shows the renal artery and the renal vein. And so the renal artery comes in and it branches and branches and branches into smaller and smaller blood vessels. And then the nephrons are situated in the body of the kidney. And then after the blood is filtered, it leaves the kidney via the renal vein. And then we're going to talk about this part, but right here, this is what is recalled um, the ureter, and this is going to drain the urine that is um, produced, um, and it's going to take it to the bladder before it travels out the body um, via the urethra. So this is a structure showing the structure of the kidney. Okay. okay, so let's look at, Skip ahead. Let's look at your hand or your handout that I gave you. Okay. So you would write here this is a nephron. 
And specifically, it's a special type of nephron that is called a juxtaglomerulus nephron. So I'm going to write that as juxta glomerulus. So juxta, oh, sorry, not glomerulus. Oh, sorry. There is a juxta glomerulus, but that's not where it is. It's called juxta medullary, sorry. Okay versus a cortical nephron. Okay. So when we look at the, um, when we look at the kidney, the kidney has, and you might want to draw a little picture here, the kidney has an outer part which is called the cortex. So I'd write, that is my cortex. And this is my medulla. So the outer part is the cortex, and the inner part is the medulla. So some of these nephrons reside primarily in the cortex, but some of them have these long loops, the loop of Henle that extends down into the medulla. And so that is the difference. But most of our cortical nephrons, if we looked at our kidneys, about 85% would be cortical. Only about 15% are juxtamedullary. Okay, so the juxtamedullary nephron is what is shown here because we have a long loop of Henle. So I'm gonna write down here, I'm gonna say loop of Henle extends down into the medulla. And this is really important because we're going to talk about um, why in mammals, and only in mammals do we see this type of nephron, but in mammals we can see that we can produce urine that is much more concentrated than our body fluids. So this produces urine more concentrated than body fluids. So that's why it's a special type of nephron. Okay, so let's look at this diagram. So you didn't, don't need to know, this is just the artery pairing it in. You don't need to know that's interlobular. It's just the renal artery branches into smaller and smaller arteries. And then you can see the afferent arterial is carrying blood into the glomerulus. So this is my glomerulus. These are, cap, are, are um, capillaries. So this is not labeled here, but I want you to label this as your glomerulus. So this is my glomerulus capillaries. Now surrounding the glomerulus is what is called the capsule, and this has another name that you might have heard before, and it's called the Bowman's capsule. So it's named after a person. So sometimes it's called the Bowman's capsule. Now then notice how these, um, the capillaries, after they leave the efferent, they go around the tubes, right? And so you can label here, these are the peritubular capillaries. So right here, this is the peri tubular capillaries. We're going to talk about how those are really important when picking things back up that are taken out of the filtrate. Okay. Now the capillary bed that goes down along the, um, actually they have it here, this particular part of it is called the vasa recta. So you put network here, and I would put, this is called the vasa recta. Let me spell that better. Vasa recta. Okay. 
this is a collecting duct. Notice how there's little openings. This would just this just means that there's another nephron attached. So many many nephrons uh, dump their product into the collecting duct. So there would be a nephron here, a nephron here, right? And this is going to eventually go down and into the pelvis of the of the kidney and then out through the ureter. Okay. So let's look at the function. So the first function is filtration of blood. This is done by the glomerulus. We do not want um, uh, big substances and blood cells themselves to leave the filtrate. So this just includes water, solutes, Right? And I'll put um, no cells. If you get blood in your urine, that means oftentimes that you have damaged the glomerulus, that your filtration membrane is allowing blood. So it could mean that you've damaged your kidney, right? Could mean that your uh, blood pressure might have blown out the capillary bed and you get blood in the urine. So you don't want any red blood cells in your urine. The second thing that the nephron does is it modifies the filtrate. Okay, so it's taken some stuff out. And so we have reabsorption. Of water, ions, and glucose and amino acids. So there's lots of good things that end up in the filtrate that we want to take back out and reabsorb. So this means that the nephron has passed these substances to the peritubular capillaries. So that's reabsorption. The second thing that can happen when we modify it is called secretion. And this is where things are put into the filtrate. So substances are added to the filtrate from the blood. So the absorption and secretion are kind of the exact opposite. So then we have the peritubular capillaries. It's going the other way, right? Okay. So sometimes drugs and vitamins and stuff like if you take excess vitamin C sometimes that vitamin C will be secreted back into your filtrate um, and we're going to talk about hydrogen ions sometimes also get passed back into the filtrate and then the third function is the collection of urine Actually, we'll put, let's put production in here. That sounds better. Okay. So if you turn your page over, the handout that I gave you, this is a simplified nephron. Okay. And it is actually showing it as it would be placed, this is a juxtaglomerulus nephron, as it's placed in the, um, in the um, kidney. So this is actually the cortex. So I would write here, I would write cortex of kidney. 
okay? This is the medulla, and they have that label. They have the outer medulla and the inner medulla. These values right here are solute concentrations. So I'll put solute concentrations. And so you see, as we move down through the medulla, this is the concentration of solutes in the fluid that is surrounding my nephron. And notice how it gets much greater as we go down. And what this is going to do is this is going to passively draw water out via osmosis. So it's very much like a system where you're setting it up and you're creating, um, it would be kind of like reverse osmosis systems where you're trying to create clean, fresh water by um, passing it through a filtration membrane. Okay. So this part of the nephron is my glomerulus. Actually, this is my capsule. So but this is my Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule. So I'll just put this is the glomerulus in the capsule. This has a specific name. And so you notice that the picture that I gave you was, shows kind of the tubules a little bit crazy, but this is definitely what is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so proximal means it is closest to the glomerulus. So it's closest to where filtration is, is produced. So sometimes this is abbreviated in your book as PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. So if this is proximal, what is this one? Distal, right? So this is the distal convoluted tubule. Right, so the DCT, this is my collecting duct. And this right structure right here is the loop of Henle. And it has um, a much different, different structure in its descending limb versus its ascending limb. So we're going to call this the descending limb of the loop of Henle. And this is my ascending limb. Right. So the, the filtrate moves in a single direction through the loop, uh, through the loop of Henley, down the descending and then up the ascending. Okay. Okay. So what is the the thing about these different locations has to do with what is happening? Oops. Stop sharing. Let me get back to there. I just wanted to hide it. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to change color here. I'm just going to hide that. Okay. So things that we need to reabsorb here would be like glucose, amino acids, water, right? So is that a reabsorption or a secretion when it's coming out of the nephron? No, nope, it's reabsorption, right? So it's moving out of the nephron and it's going to be picked up by the capillaries. So things are being reabsorbed, right? Most of everything that needs to be reabsorbed is reabsorbed almost immediately. The interesting thing about this is, is that in order to reabsorb sub substances, there has to be little receptors on the cell membrane that picks up glucose and helps to move it. So this is why if you have really high glucose levels in your blood, some of the glucose gets through and it actually comes out in your urine. So remember we talked about diabetes mellitus. One of the characteristics is, is that um, you can have um, sugar in your urine, right? And that's because there's so much glucose that there's not enough receptors and then the filtrate kind of moves on. And so some of the glucose ends up being lost, okay? So that is reabsorption. Now, the descending limb of the loop of Henle passively reabsorbs water. So I'm just gonna put H2O drawn out 
via osmosis. And if you remember, osmosis is passive. It takes no energy. It just is due to the fact that the solute concentrations are higher out here than they're in the filtrate, and so it gets sucked out. Okay. Now, um, the descending limb is permeable to water, but impermeable to sodium and chloride. And so it, the exact opposite happens with the ascending limb because the ascending limb is impermeable to water, but salt is pumped out. So I'm going to use red. So I'll say salt is pumped out. So this takes energy. It's not passive. It takes energy. Okay. Um, so I'll say that the descending limb is permeable to water. impermeable to salt. Okay, exact opposite here. The ascending limb is impermeable to water, so water cannot move, but it is permeable to salt. So it means what we have special receptors, special channels that can pump salt out. Okay. So the whole point of this is now we've kind of set up this concentration gradients, right? So water comes out here, salt comes out here, and this helps to maintain the high solute concentrations that would draw water out on this side. So here, sometimes we get what is called secretion. So here I'm going to put things coming back in, right? So this would be going the right way. It's going from the capillaries that are surrounding and we're secreting it back in. So some things that get secreted are potassium and sometimes hydrogen ions. Potassium and hydrogen ions. I don't know why it keeps kicking me out. There we go. Okay. So those are the things, so I would say, in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have the majority of the reabsorption occurring. Water gets reabsorbed in the descending limb, sodium gets reabsorbed in the ascending limb, and then we get secretion happening in the um, distal convoluted tubule. Okay. So the next thing we need to talk about is how we produce really concentrated urine sometimes and not concentrated urine other times. Right, so you can you probably all experience this. If you drink excessive amounts of water, you tend to urinate a lot, right? Or if you stop drinking water, then your urine becomes um, darker and it becomes more, maybe more odorous, right? And it's more concentrated. So we have a hormone, and this hormone is called the antidiuretic hormone. So what does diuresis mean? We talked about this when we were talking about um, blood pressure. The loss, of water. loss of water in the urine, right? So diuresis is urination. So what do you think the presence of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, causes? If it's antidiuretic, you right, you retain water, right? So it's the opposite. So this causes you to retain water, okay? So when it is present, in blood, right, it causes water channels to be inserted in the collecting duct, the collecting ducts. So we haven't talked about movement in the collecting ducts yet. So water can be drawn out via osmosis if those uh, protein channels, um, water, they're called aquaporins, they're little proteins that allow water to be sucked out. 
And so we say that this is um, a type of water reabsorption that depends upon the presence of the hormone. So when not present, Um, water is not reabsorbed. And the urine is more dilute. Okay. So this means we have concentrated urine. So this is actually a hormone that's produced by your pituitary glands. And it responds to solute concentrations in your blood. So like, for example, if you take in a lot of salt, let's say you eat something really salty, you're going to get thirsty. And the reason why you're getting thirsty is because your brain has detected that you don't have enough water to dissolve and to um, dilute the salt that you've taken in, right? And so what then is going to happen is you're going to get thirsty, but you're also going to produce antidiuretic hormone. And it is going to go to your kidneys via the circulatory system. It's going to bind to receptors on the cells, and it's going to cause those cells to insert channels that, that will allow the water to be drawn out. So not only are you going to be thirsty, but you're also going to produce more concentrated urine because you're going to retain water. Okay, does everybody kind of see that? Okay, so let's go back to our little drawing right here. So I'll put H2O if ADH is present. Okay, so that's if. So if a the ADH is present, there's these little channels that get put into the cells that line my collecting duct, and water will just be moving out passively because of this difference in the concentration gradient. So it just kind of gets sucked back out. Okay. And so if ADH is not present, water cannot move, and then it gets urinated out. So all has to do with the presence of that particular um, hormone. Okay. And it's kind of interesting to note that you can actually drink too much water, right? So if you, in the past, they had those, like, how much water can one person drink kind of contests, right? And people can actually die from that. Because once your, your ions get so, and your sugars and everything gets so diluted and your kidney is not capable of keeping up and pumping the water out, then everything is just too dilute and then your nervous system shuts down because it doesn't have the proper ion balance or glucose balance, right? So you can drink yourself to death. Yeah. I don't know, but my students told me that they had there was a competition like a radio competition and people were just chugging water and yeah it caused a person to heal over you know, their kidneys were not able to keep up okay okay so this production of this concentrated urine is due to that difference in the concentration that's all set up by that juxtaglomerulus apparatus no, yeah, juxtamedullary, sorry, the juxtamedullary um, nephrons. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, we're going to end a little early today, is kidney and blood pressure. So when you think about it, the kidneys get like 25% of the blood um, every time it circulates through the body, it goes to the kidneys to be filtered. And if the blood pressure is too high, then you can damage your filtration membrane, you can damage the glomerulus, but if it is too low, then you don't get enough filtrate being produced, okay? So two, if the BP is too high, right, you can damage the glomerulus. And this is what sometimes happens in kidney failure, right? Uh, diabetic. So diabetes can cause damage. And cause, I'll put renal failure. Okay. 
it. So oftentimes the blood pressure, people who are diabetic also have problems regulating their blood pressure. They're regulating their glucose, and so sometimes it causes, uh, oftentimes it causes renal failure, and then they actually have to go on dialysis. So this, right, um, means that you must have dialysis treatment. What is that so if you are diabetic, oftentimes um, a, uh, something that goes along with it is that you damage your kidneys because of blood pressure. And so this can cause renal failure. And so people with renal failure um, build up uh, urea in their in their body and it becomes toxic. So their blood becomes toxic. And so they have to go to a special treatment center. Actually, now I think you can get machines at your house, but generally you have to go to a dialysis treatment center. So like they have one out at the tribes, right? And you have to just sit in there and what they do is they just withdraw your blood and they put it through a machine with a dialysis membrane that acts like your nephrons and it cleans the blood and then they put your blood back in after it has been, all the nitrogenous waste has been removed. Okay, so a dialysis machine is mimics what happens in your kidneys. Okay. okay, if the BP is too low, if your blood pressure is too low, right, this means that not enough filtrate is produced. Right, and so what this means is, is that you cannot effectively um, cleanse the blood. You can't effectively get rid of all the nitrogenous waste and everything you need to get. Okay. So this means that the kidney needs to regulate um, blood pressure, and it does it by a couple of ways. So there's cells near the kidney, actually near the glomerulus, that detect blood pressure. So they actually have little receptors that can detect the blood, the pressure of the blood on the blood vessel. And they cause two things to happen. Okay. The first thing is, is that a chemical called renin is released into the blood. And renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin. So angiotensinogen, you've seen this word inogen before. Does anybody remember where? Pepsinogen, right, in the stomach. That means it's inactive, right? So this causes this conversion, renin does. And so angio, think angio, think angina, think blood vessel, and this causes tension. So this causes vasoconstriction. So what this does is this boosts the blood pr pressure. So this increases the blood pressure. vasoconstriction of the blood and it causes an increase in the blood pressure coming into the glomerulus and that renin goes out through your entire body and will cause an increase of blood pressure throughout your entire body. So the kidney is actually central to regulating blood pressure. Okay. The other mechanism is through a hormone called aldosterone. So this causes aldosterone to be released. You spell that right. Causes aldosterone to be released. Okay. This is actually from the adrenal gland. You don't need to know that. But what you do need to know is this increases sodium reabsorption in the nephron. And this increases water reabsorption. 
And remember how I said that if you increase the blood volume, you increase blood pressure. So the kidney has two mechanisms to boost blood pressure. And then if aldosterone and renin aren't produced, then blood pressure can stay low. Right. But the kidney plays a role in systemic body-wide blood pressure regulation. So when your kidney fails, that is just kind of cascading events of all the things that your kidney does for you, and one of them is regulating your blood pressure. Um, I think that's where I want to stop. Actually, let's talk about the kangaroo. Kangaroo rats are really cool creatures. Oh, I need to talk about the urinary system. Okay. So the kangaroo rat, this is a really interesting organism. We actually have them in Oregon. You can catch them with little traps if you set them out. They like peanut butter. <laughs> I've caught them with peanut butter before. Kangaroo rats um, produce no, or they don't drink water. This is the key. They don't drink water. They do, yes, they hop on their hind legs. So what this means is that they produce very little urine. So they're actually ideal pets. I've, I've mistakenly got guinea pigs. And I swear the guinea pigs they produce, they just urine, I mean it's like constant. They drink and urine and it's like, huge amount of urine, right? Having a kangaroo rat is much nicer because they don't hardly urinate at all. Okay. So, um, but unfortunately, they're native, right? So you can't buy them at pet stores. So you have to catch them if you want a pet. <laughs> they don't sell, it's kind of this conundrum. You know, it's think, you think that it'd be better to have native animals at the pet store to sell instead of non-native, right? But then they're worried that people are going to capture them and then depletes the populations. And so that's why you can only buy exotic um, species at pet stores, which is kind of, it's kind of a weird thing. But anyway, the thing about these guys is, is that they have very long loops of Henley. And this means that they can produce super concentrated urine. So because they don't drink water, they get all of their water from the metabolism of their food. So when they break down carbohydrates and proteins and stuff, water is produced during that breaking down. And so it's kind of amazing that they can get almost all the water they need for the seeds and the nuts that they would naturally eat. And so this is an extreme example, right? If you think about beavers, they actually do not have long loops of Henley. So when you compare this, to a beaver, right? They are fresh water. So we'd say they're fresh water. So they drink lots of water and they produce very dilute. So they have short loops of Henley. And their urine is not nearly as concentrated, right? So they produce dilute urine. So we even see physiological adaptations in the kidney to different um, uh, to different ecosystems when they live in different ecosystems. So this would be physiological adaptation. Right? Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is just the urinary system. So the urinary system would include the kidney, right? And there's two of them. The kidneys, as we saw in the dissection of the rat, sit kind of way back in the back. They're actually said to be retroperitoneal. They sit way back in the back of the body, and they're kind of surrounded by fat, which kind of cushions them and holds them in place. But the kidneys have a renal pelvis. And this collects the urine 
from the collecting duct, ducts from all the nephrons. So I'll just put collects urine from all the nephrons. Then it is transported via the ureter. So the ureter is part of the urinary system. This transports the urine to the bladder. And the bladder is smooth muscle. So when we urinate, the smooth muscle can contract. Right? But we have partial control over that because we can keep the sphincter closed and we can store the urine. And then it moves out through the urethra. So the urethra transports it out through the body. Or out of the body. Out of the body. Transports urine. Out of the body. Okay. Now in the male... It trans in mammals, right? It transports it out. Um, it's the same duct, so it transports the, the transports the sperm and the urine. So this would be out through the penis. The female has a separate opening. So the female's urethra, the vagina, and the anus are all separate. But in males, the urethra combines with the reproductive system. So there's actually only two openings in males. So this combines um, in the male. Right, the reproductive duct. So it has ser two serves two purposes. Okay, so in your book there is a diagram of the urinary system. Okay, oops. Okay, so this is the ureter, right? It comes down, and it actually kind of enters here. This is be the bladder, and then this is the male that comes out. This is actually showing the prostate gland. It comes out through the penis um, and out um, to the body via the urethra. Okay. So we'll talk more about that um, in uh, the prostate gland and the bladder and such when we um, talk about um, the reproductive system. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there for today. And I will see you guys tomorrow in lab. We're gonna be doing um, a diving reflex experiment. So we need somebody who can hold their breath while placing their face in water. Hopefully somebody in your group will volunteer. <laughs> and holding on to blood pressure, or not blood, yeah, a heart rate monitor at the same time. Thank you.